Thank you all uh, for joining us at this event on moving to electric only vehicles by 2030. Is that a realistic challenge? Uh, the government has sort of set this target of uh, well, stopping uh, sales of uh, combustion engines by 2030, which uh, begs, uh, begs a lot of questions, opportunities and challenges. And that's what we're going to explore uh, in this event uh, this afternoon. I must say, I'm not a sort of car person myself, but my, my I hate to say this, my 12 year old diesel's probably on its last legs. And I'm thinking, well, what do I do next? I've got to move to electric, surely, at this sort of stage. Uh, especially considering I seem to keep my cars for 10 years anyway. Uh, but um, and I think I'm probably not alone in that. I spoke to a number of people recently and everybody is beginning to think, what do we do next? And it's got to be, um, I think, a move to um, electric vehicles. And this is, of course, related to uh, one of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, which is related to affordable and sustainable transport systems. We like to uh, key our events into uh, relevant uh, sustainable development goals um, as well. I've got quite a lineup, so I'm going to be moving on to our first speaker shortly, which is uh, David Sabon, who's from the Centre of Sustainable Road Freight at Cambridge uh, University. He's going to set the scene for us. He can't be with us today, um, but he's done um, a short recording uh, just to set that uh, context. Uh, a couple of points of housekeeping as well for everybody, please. Uh, if you could keep your uh, keep yourselves muted during the course of the uh, presentations. Uh, any questions you've got, do put them in the chat box and we'll try to address those. Uh, we do have a QA and a um, at the end of the session. Uh, the event is being recorded, which I think has probably already come up on your screen for information. Um, and the, uh, the microphone is going to be handed over by speaker to speaker. I'm being made redundant uh, today, I think, because we've got uh, a range of speakers. Let's just uh, crack on with it. And one final thing is that we are going to be, well, um, Oriana in the minute is going to put up a little bit of a quiz or a couple of questions for you in the chat box, which would be pleased for you to sort of take a look at now and answer, and then take a look at them again at the end of the session and answer them again to see if your minds have, uh, have changed. Right. That's enough for me on the introduction. Oriane, over to you to set the ball rolling with uh, Professor Sabon's presentation from the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight at the University of Cambridge. Hi everyone. Uh, right, share my screen. Okay. <coughs> Hi, I'm David Sebon. I'm the Director of the Centre for Sustainable Road Freight. And I've been asked to talk about moving to electrically only vehicles by 2030. Well, I work on heavy goods vehicles, and I'm afraid that the timetable for transferring UK heavy vehicles to electric will, will not be by 2030. In fact, diesel trucks are not banned until 2040. Uh, and uh, so it'll be at least 10 years after the 2030 date before we see all heavy vehicles being electric. Urban delivery vehicles are already going electric. Uh, here is a uh, kind of a schematic map of a country showing the backbone, backbone uh, strategic road network where there are where, where heavy vehicles um, do long haul trucking up and down the network, up and down the motorways all day long, uh, and attached to the strategic road network are cities, and cities have vehicles like parcel delivery vehicles and uh, vehicles that uh, deliver goods to stores, rubbish trucks, and so on. All of these vehicles are going electric rapidly, and I think by 2030 we'll look back and wonder why we ever drove diesel vehicles like this, uh, drove diesel vehicles into our cities. So we can be pretty sure that uh, that urban vehicles will be electric, and the reason for that is that they have short ranges and they can uh, drive on a battery for the typical journeys they do, 50 or 100 miles around the cities doing multi-drop deliveries. Uh, that can be done by battery easily. And those vehicles are rolling out now. Things are a bit different when it comes to long haul road freight that travels up and down the backbone network. Heavy goods vehicles use a lot of energy and require high power outputs from their motors. And that makes it difficult to run them on batteries uh, because the batteries have to be heavy and they're expensive. So the, there, are three, there are really three alternatives being considered at the moment. One is uh, battery electric vehicles with very large batteries of order of one megawatt hour. Um, hydrogen powered vehicles, which for a series of different reasons we don't think are going to be the answer. And 
so-called catenary powered vehicles. These are vehicles that have overhead cables like railway lines, uh, like, like uh, electric railway trains or trams. They have a pantograph mechanism which reaches up to the wires. You can see here in this picture. And electricity flows from the wires straight down to the motor uh, and drives the truck forward. You can also charge small batteries on the vehicle while it's in motion. Uh, and those batteries are used to pass when, when trucks want to pass one another and for the trucks to travel 30 or 50 miles at the end of their journey off the motorway network to a warehouse distribution center uh, some distance away. Basic technology is uh, shown here. The uh, vehicle has a, uh, a pantograph which reads up, reaches up to the overhead lines. Electricity goes essentially straight down to the motor and through the electric drive. Uh, there is a battery as shown here and there can be other things attached. For example, there can be uh, generators attached. They may use gas, biogas diesel or biodiesel and they can supplement the range of the vehicle for uh, when, when longer ranges are needed off the electric road network. We've done a bit of a study looking at the rollout of such a network and figured that it's going to take about uh, 18 years. The first three years of that will be spent on a demonstration project which is underway at the moment. Uh, we're looking at a site on the M180 in Humberside. You can just see that in this picture here. There's a little mark there that's a 40-kilometer stretch of road, um, which is a demonstrator project, and we hope that that demonstrator will run during the period 23 to 2025. Uh, and then we're proposing three phases, three five-year phases of rolling out such a network across the country, and that those three phases will take us from about 2027 to about 2042. Uh, the first phase would be 3,000 kilometers of network, as you can see on this slide. Uh, these are the most heavily truck trafficked roads in the United Kingdom. You can see that they consist of the M25 around London, the M M4, M1, uh, M6, A14, which goes across past Cambridge, and some roads up in uh, in Yorkshire, and Humberside, M180, M62, and so on. Uh, these 3,200 kilometres of roads would cost about 5.6 billion pounds to build electric road infrastructure on, but it would uh, cover nearly 50% of heavy goods vehicle kilometres on in the UK on the, on the strategic road network and would decarbonise about 30% of uh, of all truck traffic. So that's a pretty good uh, pretty good bang for your buck to get 30% decarbonise 30% of the tra traffic for six million pounds of truck traffic. Uh, there's two further phases proposed, uh, and by the end of all of that, we've got about 15,000 kilometres of road which has been uh, covered which has the e-highway infrastructure cost of about 20 billion pounds it covers most of heavy vehicle kilometers in the uk and this would decarbonize 65 percent of all heavy goods vehicles now the other 35 percent are urban so between those two things the urban vehicles going electric uh, over the next 10 years or so and the this infrastructure mentioned here uh, we would get to about 100 percent of all heavy goods vehicles. The 20 billion seems like a huge amount of money, but the current road infrastructure spend, spending for the, by the Department of Transport uh, between 2020 and 2025 is 28 billion pounds, which is 50% more than this. So you can see that this is a, uh, a plausible amount of money compared to the scale of the roads budget. It would obviously require substantial investment, but nevertheless, it's the right sort of scale. We can have a, 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 a quick analysis of the finances, thinking about the cost of electricity. If electricity was sold to truckers at 25 pence a kilowatt hour, uh, then the saving on fuel cost compared to diesel would pay for the additional cost of the electric vehicle in about a year and a half. So the electric vehicle is a little bit more expensive than the diesel, but the, but the energy, the electricity is a lot cheaper than diesel if it's charged at 25 pence a kilowatt hour and the saving made would be enough to pay the vehicle back in a year and a half. Five, five cents, five pence of that 25 would need to go to pay for the wholesale cost of electricity. We think that if about seven pence per kilowatt hour went to the infrastructure provider, it would pay back the infrastructure investment in about 15 or 20 years 
and that means that infrastructure could be probably paid for by private finance. What's left at the top of this 25p is 13p, uh, about half, which uh, would be very useful tax revenue for the government and would replace a proportion of diesel tax, which is currently a diesel excise duty, which is an important source of revenue for the government. And you can see that here, this shows the three phases of rollout of the system. Uh, the baseline current condition is the current diesel tax, and then you can see that diesel tax uh, decreasing with time as the uh, as the three phases of rollout of the electric roads network proceed. So the yellow is tax from electricity, or could be a road tax. Uh, and what you can see is that by the end of the third phase, the tax generating capability of the system is not too different from the current ex diesel excise duty. If on the other hand, you did this with hydrogen powered vehicles, which I mentioned at the start, they are one of the possibilities, but hydrogen powered vehicles are very inefficient. And that means that they're very expensive and it would be necessary for the government to subsidize the cost of hydrogen, as you can see here, because otherwise it would be too expensive for freight operators and their investment would never be paid back. So with hydrogen, because of the inefficiencies, the government would end up subsidizing the cost of hydrogen for at least 15 years, if not more. And that would be very expensive. So not only do they not get the, the tax back, uh, vehicle excise duty, but uh, fuel excise duty, but in fact, they have to pay a subsidy to make hydrogen cheap enough for fleet operators to use it. Otherwise, they'll just continue to use diesel. We are currently working on a feasibility study for a demonstration project. Uh, this study is due for completion around uh, the end of March 2022. And it's looking at the feasibility of completely electrifying the national logistics system, the national road freight system, uh, using a demonstrator in the area between Emmingham Grimsby Port on the East Coast and Doncaster, encompassing the M180, which will be uh, equipped with electric road system, overhead catenary cables, and logistics facilities around Don uh, uh, Doncaster, uh, where there will be battery electric urban delivery vehicles in operation. So this will demonstrate that the entire UK road freight logistics system, all different aspects of it can be electrified. So here are the conclusions. Diesel trucks will be phased out by 2040. Urban delivery vehicles are going to be electric probably within the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, we think that uh, an electric road system is the best for long haul freight. It's practical and well tested in a number of demonstration trials in Europe. It's got high technology readiness level, lowest total cost of ownership, lowest energy, lowest carbon, and it's a financial triple win for the vehicle fleet operator, the infrastructure for provider, and for the government in terms of tax revenue. Our demonstration project we hope is going to run from 2023 to 2025 in the M180 corridor in Humberside uh, in advance of a possible national rollout of infrastructure in the period 2027 to 2042. Thanks. <coughs> okay. Okay, Orian, thank you for, for doing that. I must say that was fascinating in terms of setting the context from a freight uh, vehicle perspective. I mean, good news that we're not going to have well, we're going to have electric vehicles in our town and city centres fairly soon, uh, which uh, makes a lot of sense for everybody. Um, you know, just think about that poor last that child who had recorded on her death certificate that uh, pollution was the factor in South London um, uh, 12 months ago. Um, but, I mean, that does seem like an awful lot of infrastructure investment for that particular type of uh, national sort of route plan for, for long distance freight. Um, so shame David uh, couldn't be with us today. He's a, he's in London, but um, and of course what it might not allow for are changes and developments in technology for other forms of long distance freight. But anyway, we could maybe come back to that during the um, during the questions. Uh, but let's move on because next we have uh, Stephen Stephen Lambert, who's the head of electrification at McLaren Applied. Stephen, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll just share my screen. <clears throat> Hopefully, you can all see this. Please shout if you can't. So I'm going to talk about in the driving seat, lowering the cost of mobility um, and a little bit about how we as McLaren applied and uh, uh, moving towards lowering the cost of mobility and what changes we're going to see in the industry um, that make that happen as, as we move towards electrification. Um, 
so first, firstly, I'll just quickly go over who McLaren Applied are. Um, we are not a Formula One company. We don't go racing. We're not a supercar manufacturer. We're actually a, we're now in the last few months, a separate company from McLaren Group. I'm still based at the Technology Center, but we're a technology and product-based business. So we develop technology that goes into all sorts of industries, including automotive, including public transport, including rail, um, and of course, including motorsports. But we, we develop that next generation technology technology and so to do that we need to know where the industry is going um, and what the industry needs um, and what those future needs are going to be. So when we look at the electric vehicle industry <clears throat> there are some key trends. Firstly EV product volumes are rapidly increasing. We can see that the government incentives are there to, to support that as well but we and I'll come to this in a minute we're really at that tipping point for EV product volumes to accelerate. And the thing really that I want to hammer home um, during this, this 10 minutes that I've got is that improving powertrain efficiency is going to be key to competitiveness. And that's whether you're talking about an electric vehicle as a city car, as a supercar, as a freight vehicle, um, powertrain efficiency is going to be the most important aspect um, of any electrified vehicle. We're seeing EV infrastructure changing and improving. Um, however, at the moment, charge and range anxiety and cost remain the common concern for consumers. And actually, this used to just say range anxiety, but we're moving away from that now. What we're seeing with electric vehicles is people aren't worried about the range. You can buy plenty of EVs with a 200 to 300 mile range, if not more. Um, it's more now if I want to go for a long distance, larger than two to 300 miles, how long is it going to take me to charge? Is it going to take me an hour? Is it going to take me 10 minutes? And that, that, that starts to become the question in, in people's minds. Um, and so then the issues are around cost, weight, packaging, range, we just talked about, thermal management, essentially efficiency um, and reliability. Um, and so at McLaren Applied, we're, we're developing an 800 volt and silicon carbide inverter that addresses these issues. And it's really the, the reason we're doing that, it's the 800 volt and the silicon carbide piece that makes a big difference. And these are the key things that we need to uh, drive that powertrain efficiency and reduce it as much as we can. So, the EV industry has reached an inflection point. Um, there's an analysis on the left done by a company called Exawatt. Um, the blue line shows the total passenger EVs um, expected um, globally. Um, the green line is those using silicon IGBTs. And if, if you're not a techie, um, silicon IGBTs are what are used in the, the inverter, the motor controller today, what drives your car forward. Um, but there's a new technology called silicon carbide coming out. Um, and that's due to sort of take over and actually be the dominant technology. And the reason for that is because it is a more efficient solution and that will drive cheaper, more efficient, cheaper and better vehicles overall. And then you can align that with the move to 800 volts as well. So the majority of electric vehicles today run on 400 volts, um, but we're starting to see a move towards 800 volts. So Tesla bought out 400 volts silicon carbide in 2019, Porsche bought out 800 volts, and we're going to start seeing 800 volts and silicon carbide um, being more common in the next few years. And the reason 800 volts is a game changer again for the, uh, the automotive industry, the electric vehicle industry, is because it allows a significant reduction in charging time, up to 350 kilowatts of charging power, which is, which is a huge amount and potentially allows you to do a full charge in 10, 15 minutes or so. And so the headwinds are well known, 800 volts and silicon carbide adoption is the future. And that, this is really where we're gonna get the movement in the electric vehicle market and, and start bringing those costs down. Um, I think really the, the question has been answered as to whether the future will be EV. Um, but if you want any more proof, you can see automotive executives are supporting the EV trends. We've got Mary Barra from CEO seeing the, the inflection point for our company and society has arrived. Um, you've got people like Aston Martin launching their first BEVs, uh, Bentley saying electrification, Bentley the perfect partners. Um, but even people like Ford are saying all of their commercial vehicles will be zero emissions capable by 2024. And this is, you know, commercial vehicles are driven by their total cost of ownership um, and by the business case of having that vehicle it's not a um, it's not a purchase you made generally because you you like the vehicle it's what that vehicle can do for you and whether the business case makes sense and this is backed up by uh, McKinsey and company who said we are now at the tipping point for electrification it's not something that may happen in the future it's something that's going to happen very rapidly very quickly 
Um, an age of revolt adoption is happening now. If you, you read any of the trade uh, trade articles, uh, you can see Jaguar Land Rover planning a platform, Lucid, uh, one of the startups in the US. Uh, we've got a 900 volt system, Hyundai bought an 800 volt system out this year. And, and of course, Porsche with the Taycan, as I mentioned, um, bought out an 800 volt system uh, last year. And so again, these headwinds are really well known in terms of where the industry is going and how they're going to reduce charging times, get longer ranges uh, with powertrain efficiency and ultimately reduce the costs and those barriers to entry of cost to electric vehicles. How is this done? Um, well, 800 volts really is there from a charging point of view. It gives you a higher power throughput through cables, and that gives you faster charging. So the end user benefit is to reduce time at charging stations. Um, and of course, that's important. But really, it's this new switching technology that we're starting to see coming on board, which is silicon carbide. That gives you higher efficiency, but also higher switching frequency. Now, we, we won't get into detail here now, but, but ultimately that allows you to go to a smaller and lighter motor. Um, you have a higher speed motor, lower torque motor. Um, but what's interesting with motors is as they get smaller and lighter and as you get into higher volumes, um, because the cost of this technology will tend towards the raw material costs, it will be a more cost effective solution. Your inverter will be smaller and lighter. Your battery, again, the batteries will be the single largest cost item uh, on a vehicle, on an electric vehicle. If you can reduce the size of that battery for the same range, then you're, you're making your vehicle much more cost effective and of course, much more, uh, much more likely to be purchased and the cooling system can be reduced. So we would typically see a 60% reduction in cooling by moving to these technologies. Um, and, and a longer range, uh, typically about a 7% increase in range, or you can translate that to a 7% decrease in uh, EV battery requirement. So the, these are two technologies that are going to be transformative for the automotive industry and, and electrification moving forward. And so then the next question is, well, what, what can the UK do? How can we, how can we really make the most of, uh, of this technology? So one project that uh, McLaren Applied are involved in is a project called Escape. This is a government funded project. Um, but we are setting up a UK based supply chain for these technologies so that actually the UK can become a serious player and really part of the electrification uh, revolution globally, um, but from the UK. So we go all the way into epilayer growth and device fabrication in the UK and packaging all the way up into uh, into actual components that will go into vehicles as a tier one. Um, and so this is really important that we set these supply chains up and we uh, put the UK in the driving seat um, to be the suppliers of the future of these transformative technologies. Thank you very much. And I guess I will now pass on to the uh, to the next speaker. Which is Mark. <laughs> Apologies, Mark, yeah. Hi Mark, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Let me just get that up in one. There we go. Thank, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. That was very interesting. 800 volts is the way to go. Um, and good, good afternoon, um, everybody. Um, my name is Mark um, Samways. Um, my company is Fleet Alliance. Um, we are one of the UK's leading contract hire and fleet management. Uh, we currently manage um, one of the largest fleets in the country with over 37,000 cars and light commercial vehicles on the roads today. Um, these range from, um, these are from our, com our customers, which range from large corporations all the way down to one man bands and not forgetting um, we have a direct to consumer um, channel um, to individuals. So primarily we are a business to business fleet management company and we work very closely with all the UK's major leasing companies from, from Let's and Arvel and Lease Plan, et cetera. So all of them work with us. Um, our mission is to convert all of our fleet to electric by 2030 and how? have we faced this ch challenge? Quite simply, we try to lead by example. 
all of our own company cars are now pure electric. Personally, I've been driving an EV since 2011. Um, I remember my first one, which was a little Peugeot Iron, and I'm sure many of you out there will remember that. Um, I remember it because on a cold winter's day, not unlike today, the car had a, no, a range of no more than 35 miles. So it was really only suitable for the local trips in and out of Cambridge and around the immediate area. Back in those days, it was home charging only, as there was almost no external infrastructure. And the cars and the infrastructure have come a long, long way in the last 10 years. But our focus today is where they're going over the next 10 years. So as a company, we are on the front line. Um, we are speaking directly to the drivers, the fleet managers and the company owners on how best they face the challenges with their own fleets and businesses. How do we do this? Leading by example and driver education. So I started off with the bosses and directors of the companies. This was something I put together early this year. A lot of my customers, the bosses of the companies, were driving Range Rovers. The Porsche had recently launched a Taycan and the simple graphic shows the cost savings over a three-year lease are, with this particular driver, he personally saved £39,000. That's personally, that's in his bank account. This led a lot of the directors of the companies to start the move to electric vehicles. It was the companies leading by example. Um, in turn, they're educating their drivers. So how do we educate the drivers in the company? So we approach a company, we use a tool which is shows what it actually costs that company to have the car for a three year period. Um, so we include the rental, the VAT and the tax relief. Um, you're able to reclaim from a leased car all of the corporation tax over the life of the lease, not just the first year, the life of the lease. Substantial savings can be made over the lifetime of the car. As we filter down, we have the middle management companies, the bosses like the EVs, the directors are driving EVs. It filter, We found it filters all the way down and the bosses lead by example. Uh, middle management starting to drive PHEVs and EVs all the way down to the staff of the company. Now the staff are our final challenge. So what we did as a company, we introduced a salary sacrifice scheme. So the way that, excuse me, the way that works is the company leases a zero emission car on corporate terms. The employee makes a sacrifice from their gross salary to pay for the lease. And this includes insurance. Everybody saves money and the, the, the company car drivers are acting responsibly in driving an electric vehicle. Um, one of my last comments, is I have a limited time of five minutes and we're nearly up to that, is we are very much ahead in the provision of EVs. And before I hand over to, to Phil Gray, I wanted to put this slide. So for every 52 new plug-in cars that are registered, only one charger is being installed. That's public charges, I will add, and that must change. So thank you, everybody. I condensed that very rapidly, and I would like to hand over to Phil Gray at Oomph. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I have a slight technical problem, and I hope that uh, Oriana is going to be able to uh, show my slides on my behalf. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, okay, so do you want to kick off? So, there it is. Can you, is that okay? I can't see anything yet. Apologies. I can see it, yeah. I think everybody else can see it. I think Mark will have to go blind. So you're on your first slide, Mark. I think you just have to say which slide number Mark's on, or yeah. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is, uh, 
So, my name is Phil Gray. I am uh, a director of Oomph, and Oomph, I've just pulled this up on my own screen, so at least I can see it. So, first slide, Oriana, are we there? Yeah. Okay. So, um, we, we are looking at uh, a situation where we have a new technology, a new opportunity. So our thinking is, uh, let us look at people's behavior and, and from a, coming at it from a very customer centric point of view, there's an opportunity. And the opportunity is that why have to go to a filling point? Why doesn't that filling point come to you? So we are looking at disruptive thinking here in helping change people's behavior towards a more convenient life. Now, if we look at the second slide, um, I don't know, and I can't see you, so I don't know how many people are actually uh, driving EVs at the moment. We've had in the company an EV now for 15 months, um, and we have experienced all the issues firsthand. We launched Oomph at a parallel COP26 event in Dundee at MSIP, and it was a nine and a half hour journey. And it's not just the time to charge, it's also where to charge. And amusingly, on the way back from Dundee, we stopped at Gretna, where there are four uh, fast, uh, rapid charge uh, filling points or charging points, only to find that a, a team of uh, COP26 EV rally cars were all filling all the charging points. So not only did we have to wait for about 40 minutes, um, it was, uh, apart from doing a little bit of sales and marketing there, it was a difficult challenge because it just took a huge amount of time out of our journey. So wh when's the best time to charge an EV? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward, when you're not using it. So when you're at home, when you're at work, when you're at the station, when you're at the airport, any of those times are the best time rather than have to sit and wait. And although uh, charging uh, times will come down, uh, imagine what it was like 10 years ago on your computer when you watched the little whirly gig going round and round and round and the frustration of that time. The same phenomenon occurs when you're charging. You just want it to be quicker than you ever think it really is. Next slide. Yeah. So what are all these brands have in common? Uh, the COVID pandemic has caused us to think very differently about the delivery of services. What they all have in common, next slide, is they deliver convenience. And in a world that is moving towards convenience, why shouldn't an EV driver have the opportunity to be able to book a charge and have that charge come to them rather than them have to go and find a charge? And we know more than 50% of the UK's uh, e uh, drivers do not have off-street car parking. And even those with off-street car parking may be multiple car households. Who wins the charge overnight? So these situations are ones that we've addressed. Next slide. And we've launched a, an ecosystem of mobile charging. Uh, we have a battery pack, which is capable of delivering 40 miles of range in 12 minutes. That battery pack will sit inside, in this particular case, our Audi e-tron EV, and be able to deliver between eight and 10 charges per working shift, depending on, uh, on the, the uh, distribution of that charge. So our aim and our objective is to be able to charge our unit from renewable sources discharge that to uh, a consumer, an EV consumer, and have a software package that it manages the whole of that service, providing us ultimately with a net zero opportunity. Next slide, please. So our belief uh, is that EV, mobile EV charging will be the next last mile delivery. Uh, we have a number of very interested parties who are uh, offering, keen to offer such a service. If you could imagine uh, ordering your, uh, your Ocado uh, groceries and at the same time 
pack a, a 20 mile or a 30 mile uh, charge, then that will uh, provide you with a, a new convenience opportunity. So we hope that with this uh, uh, company, Oomph EV, we'll encourage adoption of EVs, we'll alleviate the range anxiety. And whilst appreciating what Stephen said earlier, range anxiety will come down. It's not something in perception terms that at the moment people are recognizing that it will reduce. They're actually having to change their driving habits completely uh, simply because it's not about charging time, it's about where charges are. And if you have to detour uh, off your uh, route, then it becomes a very frustrating and irritating uh, situation. So we want to be part of the new convenience living. So on that note, let me pass you across to Trevor and uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, hopefully you can all see the screen as well. So uh, I'm Trevor Palmer from EV Blocks, our time served electrician. And I've been working in the electric vehicle sector for the last four years. Um, now, as you can see, um, the general public and companies are voting with their cash to purchase electric vehicles. And the tires are starting to turn to full electric, shown in the light blue. Sadly, public charging is not quite kept up with demand, um, as some of the other speakers have mentioned, having to queue up for rapid chargers on their journeys up and down the country. An article by Automotive um, last month said that they're going to need between 40 and 50 charge points installed every day to keep up with demand. And that's just public charging points. That's not including um, your workplace charging and your home charges as well. And the government's announced uh, on the 22nd of November that all new buildings and buildings that are going under large renovation, like office spaces, supermarkets, will be required to install charging points from next year. Um, and that's gonna be a, a charge point for every five parking spaces. So that's way over what we've seen in previous recommendations. Um, so we came up with a solution. Uh, I had an electrical contracting business that installed around 500 commercial EV chargers. And one of the challenges was, you know, being able to get on and off site quickly. And this is what we came up with, you know, a universal solution for um, each, for different types of EV chargers on pedestals and means that you're not waiting for concrete to dry when you're on site. Now, if they're going to be installing up to 145,000 car charging points up and down the country for public, what's going to happen in the private sector as well? Now, we think there's going to be similar um, kind of demand in the private sector as companies with electric fleet vehicles move over the, those fleet or those leases come to an end the staff are purchasing the, those cars into the used car market, staff purchase those vehicles, and then they're turning up to work and expecting EV chargers to be installed at their workplace. So we think that, you know, well, the question will be around, can the installers keep up with, with demand as we go forward? So that's a little bit about us. You can find more information uh, on evblocks.com and have a look at us on Instagram and I'll hand over to Professor Robert Hamilton. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to try and um, share this screen so uh, bear with me one moment guys. Can you see that? Not yet, no. Has anything come up yet at all? Not yet. Okay, this is good. Good start. 
let's share this. Share it again. Yes, we've got it now. So can you see the, um, the, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Perfect, okay. Right, um, thank you very much, Stephen, by the way, from McLaren, very interesting. Uh, Mark, I'll be speaking to you as well about something to do with a, a rental of our, our fleet as well. So that was very good. And, and Phil, I know one of your colleagues, Morag, uh, I think she was working with you. Um, and EV Blocks, great idea. So I'll, I'll talk to you after this. We've got a couple of projects where we are actually looking for, for something that, that you have. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, so EVE's um, Electric Vehicles Energy Storage. Um, we are a, a multinational company um, manufacturing in the States, uh, China, India, and also Bangladesh. Um, the tr as we've all spoken about already, the transition to electric mobility is probably one of the most transformational shifts of, of our time today. Um, I'm not going to bore you with these things because we, we've all been talking about the same thing, but um, EV adoption rates, uh, we all know where they're going. They're, you know, we're at that precipice of, of uh, there's more EVs sold now than, um, than, than diesel or, or petrol cars. Um, I think the figure was 50-50 um, as of the last, um, last year. Um, so what we see is charger EV charge demand has to go up and the investment required is whichever one you look at I mean everyone's giving you different scenarios but um, we're, we're talking about billions of infrastructure that's required um, so the OEMs are transitioning a um, little bit about BMW Daimler Ford we all know what's happening we've seen the rise of the first EV companies such as Tesla Rivian uh, Byton as well and of course Polestar we see that the, uh, the governments are committed. Um, very, uh, in the UK, we're, we're having new legislation put in and across in the States there, there is a, a multi-trillion dollar um, infrastructure program going on right now. Um, and of course, Biden has just recently said he wants 50% um, of EV sales by 2030. Um, how likely is that? So with the acceleration of EV adoption, Utilities and businesses are looking for EV charging solutions that can help the grid and also not put a strain on it. Um, the cost of disruptive change has shown time and time again the need to reimagine and capture new opportunities. So similar to what uh, Phil was saying about maybe bringing power to you, that's something else we also do. Um, what is holding back parking operators, for example, and, and, and councils from introducing EV charging? We all know it's got to happen, but utility power, sometimes when you speak to the local DNO there, they can't give you more power. Um, and it goes hand in hand with, um, I think it was what Mark said, um, um, and definitely what Stephen said about uh, customers and people with EVs aren't necessarily worried about um, battery anxiety. It's all about how long it's going to be. So um, more power that's required to charge the vehicle, there's going to be a greater strain on the utility. So. There's also high upfront costs and, of course, the energy costs that we've been talking about so far. Um, they're all over the place, up and down. So how do existing uh, EV charging network solutions work today? Straight into grid, EV charger. A um, little bit about it here. So, of course, we are recording this. I'm aware about the five minutes. Um, grids in many regions are in, under increasing strain. So we're saying to roll out EV charging, utilities need a solution that delivers power, increases revenue through uh, EV charging to pay for it, is easy to install and can scale as EV adoption scales. Um, so we address the issues of available power, we optimise the grid and we increase reliability and resilience. How are we different? Well, we're using utility power, battery storage, either using uh, renewables, so to power EV charging devices. And we also have a portable option as well. Um, all of our units are also able to, to run on a demand side response program, therefore uh, putting money back into the grid at ridiculously high rates. So we're increasing the available power without upgrading the utility um, grid. So imagine you have a 50 kilowatt supply, we're able to deploy that energy and optimize that and give you 250 kilowatts of available charging infrastructure. 
um, a little diagram about how that can work within a, a parking infrastructure. Uh, again, hotels, we can put these units in. Uh, when it comes to the, uh, the gas stations, we have portable devices as well uh, that can be deployed as well as having the EV charging devices. Um, how it would work in a, let's say, um, a car dealership. So if you look at the top, we've got ultra fast uh, charging, uh, typically 350 to 450 volts. So, um, sorry, amps. Uh, we've also got a, a system or kilowatt, sorry. We've also got smaller 50, 100 and uh, 150s. So we're really focused on um, DC fast charging. Uh, capable of being deployed anywhere. So you can run them off grid connection, wind, solar, hydrogen, LPG, uh, whatever's available. We are unique in that respect. Um, optimized energy management so we can maximize profits for a business, reducing energy costs, uh, flexible models to suit any business. Um, so we, we actually deploy these free of charge to most companies. So where we would make our money to pay for the units, um, we would charge um, energy as a service model. So we, we're deploying these free to every council uh, gas station um, and we're deploying them free of charge as of uh, January the 1st. Um, so host owned, Eve zoned, hybrid. Um, revenue growth, accelerate EV adoption with our supporting charging solutions. So they're scalable, they're smart, they're mobile, safe, flexible, fast, and obviously commercial. Um, now I'm aware that I've gone over the, the, the five minutes, so I'll stop here. There's plenty more that I could go through. Um, so how does that, any questions at all so far? Well, that's very good, Robert. We're uh, just conscious of time, so we're gonna keep on with the, uh, with the presentations. I'll stop. So right. thank you very much for that. There we um, go. I'll let you do the, the handover, young man. Thank you, Robert. That's, uh, that's very kind of you. Um, so next we have uh, Hugo, Hugo Spauer, who's the uh, founder of River Simple. Hugo. Good afternoon. And uh, I'm sorry, my um, camera doesn't seem to want to work. So uh, you won't see me, but hopefully you see my slides. Yes, we can. We are, I'm speaking from River Simple, we're a sustainable car company rather than a hydrogen car company. We believe very strongly that we need uh, to pursue both technologies in parallel and we can decarbonize much quicker if we do so. Uh, after all, we don't argue about whether solar PV or wind turbines are going to win the renewable energy race. They're just different and we need them both. But... Um, we have been developing hydrogen cars for uh, the last 20 years, and we've uh, four generations of car. This is the first car that we've designed for use on the public road for type approval. And it's the result of a whole system design approach. There are very few advantages to being a startup, but a, a really big one is that we have a, the luxury of a clean sheet of paper. And we believe that the breakthrough in performance and commercial viability is in, in, in at the system level rather than through subsystem uh, uh, optimization. So this car does naught to 60 in nine and a half seconds. It does the calorific equivalent of a petrol car doing 250 MPG. And importantly, it does this with a fuel cell of only 10 kilowatts. We contrast it with the Toyota Mirai. This is a brilliant bit of engineering and I don't want to be critical of the auto industry, um, but they necessarily have to incrementally adopt hydrogen in their manufacturing model, uh, their technology, their business model, their distribution model. And, and the focus is on the subsystem de development. Now, clearly it's not equivalent to our, we're, our car isn't equivalent to that, it's a two-seater, not a four-seater. But the Toyota has got a fuel cell over 10 times as powerful and uses three times as much hydrogen per mile. And the differences shouldn't be so dramatic. So the choice between batteries and hydrogen is really a matter of range and utilization. Stephen mentioned the importance of powertrain efficiency, and we absolutely agree with that. Um, and the powertrain efficiency of a battery vehicle can't be beaten. But there's more to the story than that. And vehicle efficiency is what really matters at the end of the day. And that also depends hugely on weight and batteries are heavy. So the government has concluded 
that we need hydrogen for HGVs. And I agree with that. Uh, but they've reached the right conclusion for entirely the wrong reason. They think it's because they're large and heavy. And we can easily make a battery electric HGV if we're happy to do 50 miles a day. But it's not what HGVs do. It's the range and the uptime that means that we need hydrogen for HGVs. And conversely, at the other end of the scale, the only mature sector for uh, hydrogen mobility is in forklifts and pallet carriers. Now, these are not large, they're very small vehicles, but they use hydrogen because for the same reason, utilization and productivity. And this applies across the board uh, from pallet carriers through cars, buses, HGVs, uh, that if you want long range and uh, high uptime, we can achieve this more sustainably with, uh, with hydrogen than we can with batteries. We also often hear that 80% of miles, 80% uh, of journeys are less than 20 miles. And this is probably true. And we really should be using battery vehicles for those applications. But nobody points out the corollary of this, which is that 80% of miles are driven in the other 20% of journeys. And that, that's the bit where we need hydrogen. It's also 80% of the problem, of course. Um, but equally, we uh, are clear that it is every bit as important to have a change in business model. If we sell cars, uh, we are rewarded for obsolescence and high running costs. And uh, the, the most that a, a manufacturer will see of the revenue generated by a car in its life is about 40%. The rest of it goes to other, uh, other suppliers. If on the other hand, we move to selling service, and in our model, customers would typically take, take a car for three year uh, contracts, they pay a monthly fee with a, including a mileage rate, which covers everything. It's the only transaction they have. And it includes most specifically the fuel. And in this instance, we're developing cars that we're not uh, selling as a product. We're developing revenue generating assets to sit on our balance sheet. And we're, we're rewarded for, for longevity and low running costs rather than obsolescence and high running costs. It brings our interests into alignment with those of of policymakers and what we're all trying to achieve at a society level. And I believe that this area is something that doesn't receive nearly enough attention. Uh, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. And sorry about the camera. Hugo, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, so let's move on now to our connections with India. Lena Peach Thomas, are you available for us from, uh, from Bangalore? Orianne, do you know if Lena is with us? Yes, she should be there. So Hello, calling. sorry, ah. I've, I've been here and just trying to unmute and join, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, muted myself and uh, was talking to myself just a minute, yeah. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without somebody uh, being yeah, okay. So hello, everyone. So happy to join you all, uh, you know, from Bangalore, uh, uh, India. Uh, so we've been, uh, you know, members of Cambridge Clean Tech and also uh, GBI's UK office is based out of Cambridge Clean Tech. And we've been working very closely with the ecosystem to look at how we could bring European and UK technologies, especially in the clean tech space, um, you know, into it. And um, uh, and also from India now into the uh, uh, into UK. So I'm very happy to talk to you about our focus on electric vehicles, which is growing. I think many of you would have seen images of India, where uh, transportation and uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming from diesel-powered vehicles is the second biggest creator of uh, you know uh, uh, of of. Uh, 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 a uh, uh, second uh, biggest uh, you know uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions for india and this is an area where we believe that if we support uh, the uh, transition to cleaner sustainable mobility it can have a big impact for india and the world so with that in mind uh, we wanted to share a bit about the um, europe india ev ecosystem connect platform and what's happening in um, 
in India in the space uh, is very important. Uh, uh, just hold on, I'm trying to move to, um, uh, you know, screen share slide mode. Uh, oops. Uh, hold on. Just a minute, sorry. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, you know, we just wanted to share some case studies of, you know, very concrete opportunities because we just have five minutes. The Indian uh, electric vehicle market is, is growing rapidly and they are looking, for example, for solutions from Europe. And uh, this is an example of a company called Lithium Power. They are uh, seeking our support to enter the European market and connect with uh, battery manufacturers and other EV ecosystem uh, uh, OEMs who can benefit from their technology. So both ways. And there's Aether Energy. Uh, they have uh, now set up an office in Europe and have approached GBI to support them with European EV ecosystem connects, for example. Uh, here is a case study of one of uh, uh, India's largest um, uh, car fleet operators. This is the Uber of India called Ola. And uh, they are, uh, you know, they actually have grown so well uh, into the electric mobility space that they acquired a Dutch, Dutch EV startup. And this really uh, portrays the potential of Indian companies to disrupt markets and how European technology has supported them on this path. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, uh, so because of all of these developments and the growing opportunities and the policy, positive policy framework in India, we set out to create the uh, Europe uh, and India EV Ecosystem Connect platform. Uh, uh, we are also participating in this uh, platform via Enterprise Europe Network. Uh, GBI is the Enterprise Europe Network node in India. We also have an office, uh, uh, as I mentioned, in the UK as well as in, in Europe, trying to build and bridge these uh, markets. And in this platform, we want to create like a knowledge exchange and B2B an investment oriented program that will facilitate, you know, the access to EV technologies in India and Indian connects there. And we are very keen to also build bridges with UK uh, on the UK India level, uh, you know, uh, uh, given the kind of very strong relations the UK has had with India over the years. Uh, so, and just to let you know how we support, uh, uh, you know, uh, these activities. Now, currently, we are working with uh, the uh, uh, Indian companies in concern. We are talking with, uh, you know, Finnish uh, uh, organizations that want to look at fleet uh, management. We're talking to German electric vehicle companies that want to enter India, apart from the uh, uh, couple of Indian examples that we just shared. And essentially, when we work with uh, companies, we support them with market research viability assessments, uh, looking at uh, uh, identifying customers and partners, manufacturers, distributors, investors, to kind of uh, uh, navigate them uh, into the Indian market uh, or, you know, Indian companies into the UK market. And in a nutshell, uh, before I wrap up, you know, this is a quick uh, 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 sense of the process, apart from the case studies, uh, to give you a sense of how we kind of manage cross-border movement of technologies right from market validation, uh, connecting with potential customers and partners and looking at the localization strategies. So with that, you know, uh, it's a short thing, but I'm really happy to connect and look at all of the exciting European uh, uh, and UK uh, tech companies. Hope this has intrigued your uh, interest in India and I look forward to uh, developing connections with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lena. Thank you for that uh, contribution from uh, from Bangalore. Um, and now over to Sylvie, who's going to just say uh, a few words on our Mobimix uh, program. I'm just conscious of time. So if you could zip yes. through a few slides, Sylvie, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. So, yes, I'm here to present you a, a, a European project called Mobimix. We heard about e-cars and e-chargers, but can e-cars and e vehicles in general be part of a wider mobility plan? We've seen the rise of technology and especially the mobility as a service. We've seen the rise of uh, 
different uh, technologies to be able to go from A to B. But there is really a need for effective collaborations between uh, the public sectors and the private sectors, and probably to establish new policies. The highway code was uh, implemented in the UK in 1931. Is it maybe probably time to have something uh, to look at share mobilities within cities and create something? So the end of this um, project is really to have two objectives. One of them is the collaboration between public authorities and private smart mobility providers, just to increase um, the flow of low carbon technologies, but also, and maybe above all, to respond to another need, which is the reduction of CO2. And the program Mobimix is here to demonstrate that. How is it going to do it? First of all, well, just quickly, started in March 2020, might not be the best time to start uh, a mobility project as we were all um, more or less stuck at home, but at the same time, a great opportunity to look at air pollution and change our habits. We have 11 partners across different European countries. And um, the outlook is really to, to look at different uh, reports and create um, reports that are based on research, analyze, analyzing, demonstrating what's happening in five cities, and put that out, out there to other public authorities and private sectors. The aim is really to create a good communications between all of the sectors. So for example, in Rotterdam, in um, Holland, it's a mobility solution is all about car sharing and looking at the different habits, how we can share cars and maybe probably reduce a parking space and numbers of cars on the road through this yeah. program. In Belgium, this is all about mobility as a service. What can we do to change the behavior of each other? And just be able, David, would you be, yeah, thank you, mute yourself. Um, and reduce the car commuting to look for other solutions. Here in the UK, with an Norfolk County Council, uh, we have um, e-scooters, and it really is about studying who is using it, why, when, and how, and how we can implement this into the overall general planning of the county. And in France, in Valencia Metropole, it's about mobility hubs. How can public sectors, public transport, communicate via new technologies and be able to offer a very smooth journey from A to B to the end user? In Belgium, it's all about cargo bike. Yes, we can go on a bike, but if we have a cargo bike, do we need a car? That's one of the questions they might uh, answer. And so I will invite you to go and join the Mobimix um, website and look at the different outcomes. We have started to have a, a guide about how to effectively have a better collaboration between the public and the private sector, and really to start the conversation about better policies. So the ECAR can be part of a share mobility and at the same time reduce CO2. Let's join that journey together. Thank you. Okay, Sylvie, uh, th thank you very much. Are you going to do the introduction? Or? I was, but uh, you can... Oh, no, you carry on. Yes, I would like to introduce you to Taf Motsi, and um, is our last speaker. So just, you know, pay attention. And uh, yeah, Taf, over to you. And I'm just going to stop my share. Yeah, thanks everyone. So let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, my name is Tafad Zomotsi. I'm from, um, I work for the Advanced Propulsion Center here in the UK. So today I'll, I'll talk to you about how we are accelerating progress within the automotive industry at 
uh, the Advanced Propulsion Center. So the Advanced Propulsion Center, or APC, uh, collaborates with the UK government and the automotive industry and academia to basically accelerate the industrialization of technologies, supporting the transition to deliver zero emission vehicles. So our goal is to ensure that the UK is a world leader in low carbon automotive innovations. We provide a mechanism to support UK inward investment through our funding projects, which I will, uh, programs, which I will go through in a few minutes. The Advanced Propulsion Center was formed in 2013 and is a partnership between industry and the UK government. We have had great success so far with over a billion pound worth of projects uh, that we have supported to accelerate the development of this low carbon propulsion technologies within the UK. And I'm basically showing you guys the impact that we've had so far. So we've got more than a million vehicles with APC funded technologies within them. We have uh, saved 260 million tons of CO2 uh, through all those projects and we have created or safeguarded about 50,000 jobs. So we are doing something in this particular space. So I thought to add this slide to explain where exactly the APC sits within the, you know, the funding landscape. And obviously when you're developing a product or, or technology, you start with um, research, then you have a proof of concept, then application readiness, then you start thinking about industrialization and scaling up. And the APC, we are mostly at the end of that process where we've got application readiness, industrialization at scale, but also we've got another program at the proof of concept, which is our accelerator. So I'll briefly go through some of those uh, programs uh, in the next few slides. So we provide collaborative R&D funding. So this is basically to bridge the gap between prototypes. So you can, you can come up with a prototype. So we're trying to bridge that gap between prototypes and commercial project, uh, products. Um, and we run three competitions a year and we provide funding between five and 40 million pounds, you know, for you to develop, to turn your prototype into an actual commercial pro product. Another, another fund um, program we have is the Automotive Transformation Fund. The purpose of this fund is basically to support the UK's transition to electrification. Um, this is to anchor the capability um, within the UK for all this future demand for electrification. So we support new manufacturing facilities through capital investment for factory equipment, land, buildings, and setup costs. We support industrialization and scale up of a number of things. Uh, for example, batteries, uh, if you're thinking about gigafactories, giga fuel cells, motor, motors and drives, um, factories for producing power electronics and all that kind of stuff. We support you know, that transition to electrification through that particular fund. Then as I mentioned, uh, we, we also want to help the early, you know, early, early, early companies, early stage companies that are developing innovative pro products. We want to help them too. And we've got an accelerator called the Technology Developer Accelerator Program. On this accelerator, we basically help SMEs with their innovations and help them accelerate those into, in, 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 into products that they can actually sell. It's an 18-month accelerator program. Uh, we provide industry support. We, we provide expert industry support. Um, and this is through helping you guys, you know, uh, with moving your ideas from concept phase to viable market propositions, right? So any startup within this um, webinar today, you're more than welcome for you to go onto our website and basically reach out to us because we actually have um, the next cohort of companies coming onto the APC program uh, sometime in, 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 uh, in 2022. So jump on our website and look at our accelerator. At the APC, we, we recognize that the transition to electrification is not just a challenge for the government alone, but it's for the whole ecosystem. So we have created um, the national networks, as I'm showing on this slide, and this creates communities around key technologies. So whether it be it power electronics, batteries, whatever, right? So we are creating that network 
um, and communities to, to, to facilitate collaboration was we realized that through collaboration, through networks and, and communities, we can, you know, speedily accelerate transition towards electric vehicles. We also have um, our technology trends group within APC, and these are the intelligence guys within APC. So they come up with automotive roadmaps, and this provide a view of the key technology trajectories um, in low carbon propulsion technologies. And, the, and all this provides a guide to technology developers and also to investors, right? So investors, will, when they look at these technologies and the trajectories, they'll like, gain confidence that uh, this is a growing market and they can actually get a return on investment. And our intelligence group provides um, reports which you guys can access on our website. So if you go on our website, look at uh, various reports there, you can um, get access to that free of charge. So this is just a little bit about the APC. Obviously I had five minutes, so I didn't have quite a lot of time, but this is just a little bit about APC and how we are playing our part in facilitating the acceleration towards electric vehicles through all these funding programs and our accelerator program. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Martin.